Well, welcome back to the channel. Um, apologies that it's taken so long to get this third video out. We've just been really busy and we've had some staff off and it just put us back. Um, this is a fairly long video and in actual fact, I've decided to split it over two videos. So I'm gonna upload two videos tonight, um, both at the same time. Um, and the reason for that is one, this video was quite long, but secondly, some of the video was well, some of the checks we do before we go ahead and do time and channel work on these cars and I thought, I'd rather separate that because if we can have a shorter video to show, we can actually just send that to customers to say, look, this is what we're going to do before your car comes in um, and actually gets touched. Um, this has got no flow in it really whatsoever. These are just clips that we've recorded over the last year or so on these cars. So apologies for that. Um, and we're going to go into some of the petrols at the end um, and then I'll just discuss what we think on the petrols and on the on the diesels um because i did say before that you know i'd own one so i'll explain why that is so we actually had the jag back and you can see the this has been rectified as it happens but you can see the amount of oil underneath here and where it was leaking from and uh when we got it in we presumed it was a rear main oil seal which you can see it's dry and we haven't cleaned it off. But it turns out, once we'd taken this cover off, the sealant hadn't gone off. It was completely wet still and uh, just hadn't sealed. And when I was speaking to him about it, apparently the makers of the sealant has had them. It was Land Rover sealant that we used, but apparently they were on back order for a little while because they had an issue with it for this very reason. So we've had to pull the gearbox back out and uh, reseal the timing cover free of charge, which is a bit of a pain. But short of that, it would have been trying to put a warranty claim in for Jag, but how'd you do that when you, you know, you wouldn't have ever known that that was the issue till you pulled it apart. So one of them, another uh, job redone, but it is what it is. Right, so I've got a bit of an interesting one. Um, did, can't remember if we even included this in a previous video, but we had a timing chain, balance shafts, no, no yeah, balance shafts, on a Evoke, uh, the customer also had a coolant loss and there's a common issue with the thermostat housing. I don't know if it'll show on camera, but you can sort of see where it's white and fuzzy, where it was leaking from a joint um, down the bottom. No, I can't get the camera in there, but you can see the new thermostat housing. Anyway, I had a, had a leak and he said, while you're there, change the coolant pump to you know, prevent any future issues. So we did, um, but when it came in, you could see dripping coolant and you can kind of see bits of rust and stuff where the coolant's been dripping down there. If I can get the camera to focus. But, um, yeah, so we definitely, we had a, you know, a, a, an external coolant leak. Anyway, gave the customer a car back. Um, we road tested it to death and couldn't see, um, uh, sorry, we, we had a coolant light come on, topped it up. Quite common. We use a vacuum filler, but you do get airlocks in these occasionally. Quite common. Gave it to the customer, he got it back. Bearing in mind, we'd road tested it twice, two or three times. Got like, you know, put a fair few miles in it. He took it back, had coolant light the next day. Felt typical air bubble, whatever. He topped it up, then said, nope, sorry, this, this is losing coolant. So we brought it back, and we've pumped it up, and we have been losing pressure. So what we did last night, we put some UV dye in the tank. And if I use, this is a aircon kit actually, but it's, it's a really good UV torch, so we're gonna use it. I don't know if using this over the camera filter will work. But we're gonna try it anyway. No, it doesn't work. Ah, it does work very difficult to sort of try and hold it. Hang on, I'll get some assistance. Right, so if you shine that coolant cap there, you can see how well that lights up. And if you shine it in the coolant bottle, you can see, you can see how well it shows the, nope, you had it right, the, yeah, hold it down there a bit more. Down down to the bottom of the coolant cap, you're, you're. Oh, sorry. No, you need to get the angle right. You need to come in between that engine mount and that coolant bottle. And if you can see how well it shines up, straighten the torch out a bit. You can see how well it shines up the coolant with this with these glasses on. So you can see what we're doing. Anyway, we have been over this whole cooling system um, and we cannot see any leaks. And if you have a look, 
with the normal torch, I suppose. You can see a little black dot that I have put on that coolant bottle when I've pumped it up last and the coolant has dropped that far down and there is no leaks in the car and there is no leaks externally. So now what we've got to do is try and find out where the leak's coming from. Uh, you've got a transmission cooler, you have a charge cooler and you've got this fuel cooler here. Um, and yeah, now it's going to be a case of trying to find out where it's coming from. You've also got the EGR cooler and the head gasket. I don't think it'll be a head gasket. Um, I'm just, my initial suspicion is the charge cooler, but we've also got the EGR cooler, as I've said. So what we'll do is we'll go through trying to find it. Um, the problem I've got now is that we have, where we've pumped this up, that has swallowed so much coolant, we don't actually want to start it. Because if that's in the charge cooler now, that's going to ingest that into the engine. So it's uh, another dead car here for the minute until we find out where it's coming from. If it's coming through the EGR cooler, then it should, in theory, just go out of the exhaust. But again, we don't really want to start it. We're going to get that coolant out. But the amount of coolant that's gone through, that's lost at least a litre. And there is absolutely nothing on the ground. And there is nothing inside the car, on the carpets or anything. So it's definitely got an internal leak. But that's how we're going to try and find it. Right, so just the first thing I've done, I didn't really think about this before I stopped the video, was I've taken the fuel cooler off. Um, we'd expect to see that filling up, really. Um, certainly, if we had coolant in it and it's not, so that's good. I took both pipes off and there's nothing coming out, so that's good. That sort of ruled that out. And then the EGR cooler is here. And I am sort of thinking we could probably just take this pipe off and get to that first, so we probably will, because we've got a pipe here and the pipe at the end, and we can probably just put a camera down it. So we'll go with that next. So we thought we'd have a bit of a different approach and actually just pull the charge cooler pipe off the bottom um, just to see if the coolant is entering there, which could be the EGR valve or the charge cooler. And if we patiently wait, you will see that we have found the issue. Well, you can see all that coming out of the charge cooler. Um, we were sort of half expecting that. Doesn't mean it's diagnosed though, because if you have a look at this EGR cooler, there's every chance it could have filled up and come down into here. So we're going to take this uh, charge cooler off as well and just check. And then what we're going to do, we're going to pump it up again uh, with that intercooler disconnected and see if it comes out. But you can see why we didn't want to start it. Um, don't mean to be um, rude to anyone, but if you'd done that test and then jumped in that car, like obviously that is leaking, yes, but while you're driving, it's obviously burning a tiny bit of coolant as it's going. Not even enough to smoke, because there was no smoke, but if you would imagine that dumping a litre suddenly straight through the intake, you could uh, lock the engine up and, and run it, which is why I did not want to start it. But yeah, we're gonna just take this EGR cooler off eight mil here and here, and see if we can repeat the test, because we'll see if it's coming straight out of the charge cooler or it's coming out of this EGR. So we've got this EGR cooler out enough now. Um, you can see, if I just grab that UV tool, you can see, if it will show on camera, signs of the UV. So we know we're in the right place. That doesn't mean it's the EGR cooler because obviously it's passing through that anyway. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna pump it back up and grab a torch and I'm gonna keep an eye in here, which I don't think I'm gonna be able to show on camera. Um, I don't think the camera will get in there enough. Go on, pump it up. It might do. It may do. We will see it running out here. Which we can't. We'll let it, we'll pump it up, we'll let it run and then we'll, we'll cut back in. Right, thought of a slightly better idea after all that, just take this pipe off and this will completely isolate it because uh, there is nothing on this charge cooler circuit now. We've taken the bottom pipe off and we're taking this off so Andy's going to pump it up. Oh, you see that drip getting faster and faster and faster till it's like a stream. 
and there's nothing coming out. So it needs a charge cooler. Just thought we'd show you how we're diagnosing that. Uh, some of you sort of find this sort of thing interesting. Um, but yeah, simple, done, and now we're happy to move the car because we've isolated that. Obviously we won't have any turbo and it won't run very well, but it will move. And we've got another Evoke here. Um, this is another Ingenium. Now this came in for a oil leak um, on top of the gearbox, which we looked into and we resealed the timing cover. However, it, it, I'm sorry, and also it also had some leaks on the rear or the transfer box, which is very common. So it came in, um, there was a few other little issues with it, which we resolved. However, the oil leak happened again. So we got the, this was at the time when we were sort of following the Land Rover guide. We then got the vehicle back in where we were putting sealant on top of the head gaskets ourselves. Um, and unfortunately it still didn't work. So what do you do, who's it down to? So we just said to him in the end, we said, look, it's been off and it was leaking. Whoever did, whenever it came back from the timing chain, it was leaking. So we think we're gonna take the head off to put a better gasket on it, a new gasket on it. And what you can actually see, there is a step on this timing cover. There is a little step. And there's that, bear in mind there's dowels on these timing covers. I'm not sure what's quite gone on. I'm wondering if somehow the timing cover was broken and it had been replaced because the aluminium on it looked a different color slightly. So I th have a feeling that the timing cover, for some strange reason, has been replaced with a used one, but the trouble is these are all machined together, so there's a slight step. And if we look at the timing, uh, sorry, the head gasket, you can also see it's quite visibly damaged, which you couldn't really see in the car. And I think, I think basically someone's chopped away at it to try and seal it up. Um, because although I've just, as I've just said, we do pull the layers down. We don't pull them down to bend them. We just pull them, we pull them down a fraction. Uh, then once we've pulled them down just a fraction, we put a cable tie. So that's how thick, how thin we sort of make the, the gap. Um, we just put a cable tie underneath it and then we inject some sealant with a syringe before putting it back on. And we've never had a problem since doing that. But this one is proving a bit of a pain, so I'm glad we pulled the head off. Um, but we've sort of got to decide what to do about this step. Um, it's not horrendous, you can't even see it on the camera. But And I, th I do feel that sealant will be absolutely fine. But you can see the pool of oil on the top there, where it's been leaking. But it's an interesting one, because ultimately, who is all the labour down to? So, back to the one with the oil leak. Um, the problem we've got with this one is this gap is going to be a problem now it's not very thick really not very sorry not very big gap but so you would sort of think a bit of sealant so although this is the basically although this is the head gasket that is sealing this surface up to here it doesn't really matter because this is all going to be perfect anyway it's just from this point and that just then basically becomes a timing cover gasket so you could say let's just put sealant around it which is fine and that in theory would work but the way this gasket works is it's multi-layer as you can see and it does rely on the crushing of that gasket together to keep it from leaking so although we would seal that gap at the bottom effectively this would never be crushed in fully and I don't think we'd stop that leak so what I think we're gonna have to do is we are gonna have to make a gasket either out of this old gasket material or a bit of even possibly paper gasket would be absolutely fine um, just to take up the slack in that. Short of that, it is really, there's only two options to, to do this, which is strip the engine out, bare block it, and get this whole thing skimmed, which is gonna cost thousands, or alternatively, it's a new engine really, or a new bottom end, um, but you can see, you can see, if you look at the, can you see the difference in the middle? So you've got the dirty engine here, the timing cover and then you've got the gearbox and you can see that that's weathered differently so I think that the problem is that it's been replaced that's been replaced um, that has been replaced with one a used one or something and it's no good so what my way forward with this I've cut just a layer this is not the timing chain end but of this whole old head gasket off and the, the gap is not basically that is not perfect if it, it's, it's a tiny bit proud but that will be fine so I think we are gonna, the only thing I've made a mistake, we did have a timing chain in, which I've done, and unfortunately I've put the cover back on because it would have been the perfect template to 
to cut out, but I think we're gonna try and make a little shim up with the old gasket. It'll be held in the right place by the uh, bolts anyway. And we will use a small amount of sealant, which will be fine, um, and, and go from there. I think that's gonna be the way forward other than trying to... Right, have a lovely day. Trying to take this engine out and charging him Sorry. all that money. Right, so what we've done is we've cut a layer of the old head gasket up, which sits perfectly in there. Um, yeah, and that's going to shim it out. Bit of sealant, that feels the perfect. If anything, it's like a tiny, tiny bit below, but that'll be fine. It's absolutely perfect. So that effectively is going to take up the slack. So obviously this is just a timing cover gasket. It's all the purpose of this side of the head gasket's job is, is to stop oil leaks. So if this stops oil leaks, this is, this is fixed. So we're going to put this under the gasket. I'm going to clean all the surface of the head up, um, clean all the timing cover, and we'll lay a little bit of sealant down underneath this shim and on top of this shim, and uh, we'll go from there. Well, that's saying that Jar Vehicle Services. So, this vehicle here, this Land Rover Evoque, they're very common and has a problem with these EGR coolers. They have a filter inside, it looks like a metal gaze, and they're very common over time, I can get blocked up. Uh, what can cause these to block up, which we have found, is when the DPS crack inside, and a telltale sign of that is when you have a lot of black soot over the tailpipes and a lot of various EGR flow fault codes in there. This vehicle has had work done on the DPF in the past, but it also has a EGR flow fault code. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this off here and inspect what the filter looks like. So with the gearbox out, because we're doing a timing chain at the same time, it's a lot easier to get to this, this unit, as you can see because normally you have a subframe gearbox, everything in the way. All right. So as Andy said there, they're quite common for uh, these filters to block up. It's usually a reason for them. They don't normally block up on their own. It's usually the DPF is cracked. Um, this particular one, I think it had a load of um, DPF cleaner chucked through. Um, possibly a sticky out blue injector. Um, but I think it was mainly the DPF cleaner. You'll see there was a load of it on the Abu injector, and that's what we decided it was in the end. There we go. As you can see here, this is the filter, and as you can look here, all blocked up here, and you can't even see daylight through it. Look how dirty that is. So we're going to be putting a new one of these on there and then resetting the code and rechecking. So we're just going to be reassembling this back together now. We put a new gasket on here and we will show you what the new filter looks like. So we put that in this case, and that literally just pushes in a new little rubber seal that goes around here, new gasket, and uh, we'll be sending this back together. And this is just him putting it back together. Um, I've just sped it up, obviously, for video purposes. But these uh, EGR filters, when they're blocked, you get an EGR, I believe it's B, maybe C, I can't quite remember off the top of my head, but insufficient flow. So if you ever get that code, um, it's very unlikely that it is actually an EGR valve, it is usually these. If you get it on the, the twin turbo, uh, transverse and uh, longitudinal engines, um, quite often it can actually be because of lack of compression in one or two cylinders, so you need to watch that as well. Um, but yeah, the EGR codes on these, the EGR valves are tend to be very reliable, it's usually something else thrown in. And all that's left now is to put this little bolt here in this bracket, plug this plug back in here and then it's all finished and done. So another common problem on these Land Rovers we're experiencing is this Ablu injector here, they get blocked up. And as you can see here, the hole, that, that hole there, it should be completely unblocked. And this is like half blocked up where the Ablu is all crystallized. And what happens is puts up Knox Fox codes on the engine ECU. So another common issue on these Land Rovers that we find. So what we do is we clean these out, these holes, put a new gasket on there and a new clamp and then reset and 
re-clear all the adaptions and then retest. Right there, so when we come to changing these seals on a Land Rover, there's a special tool, as you can see, of a plastic sleeve. A new seal goes onto it like that, it pushes on, and this sleeve then pushes down, so you can so zoom in here, mm -hmm. this, this here slides on, goes onto there like that, and then this tool here pushes this down. And all we do is we just tap this tool, as you can see here, on. And that's done. And this is just a picture. This is the VVT pulleys on the diesels. Um, we have seen this a few times that they tend to crack. And these next clips are what I had left of doing a petrol ingenium engine timing chain and variators. The pulleys had fallen apart and they were floating all around um, when they should be solid. So this next couple of clips is on the petrol. Right, so the timing cover is off the jag now. And we have found an issue. Hopefully it will, the torch the camera will focus if we have a look at this group this chain guide you can see how loose that is and oh, I can't see on camera but that tension doesn't look right to me so we're gonna pull that out and have a look so that is the chain all back on both variators on it's a very similar chain to the other ingenium but you don't have a fuel pump and um, the tools are slightly different so that was yet more tools that needed to be bought um, so we're gonna clean all the face of the head gasket off and put some sealant around it all and there's no audio on this one so i'm just doing a voiceover this was a petrol ingenium water pump that had gone faulty a very similar design to the diesels but they seem to play up on the petrols that shroud moves in and out with an electronic solenoid and they tend to seize up so that one is stuck so that shroud is covering up the water pumps it wasn't doing a lot a little tap of a screwdriver and you can see it's gone back down um, they have modified this part as with most of the parts that fail, they have revised it and there is a new one out there to stop it. But you do get a fault code for, I think it's like water pump or cooling pump performance. And that was um, the code on this one and that was the fault with it. So what do I think of them then? Well, look, there's a lot of issues with them. Um, there's a lot of uh, big bills that do come up with them. Uh, there's, no, there's no denying that. Um, a thousand pounds is just not a lot of money to these cars, unfortunately, um, in repairs. It's not to say that it happens all the time and you have to chuck money at them all the time, but they, they do suffer with, with issues. Um, I think the main issue with them is the fact that they weren't marketed properly and no one's ever, no dealership or, you know, salespeople are ever 100%, maybe not clued up, but they don't 100% tell you the full story as a consumer, which I think is a problem, not just with Land Rovers, but, you know, just across the board we had a jaguar in for a timing chain and we should have we should have done some filming on it it had done 167,000 miles and the chain started rattling the engine was so clean inside it was it was unbelievable the bottom end bearings and everything were perfect the guy had driven all over the i don't know about the world but he'd driven miles across europe and i'm sure he said like driven to malta or something i don't know Anyway, did loads of loads of journeys, and it was in for some glow plugs and some time a timing chain, and you could have eaten your dinner off the inside of the engine. It was so clean. Um, he never had any issues with it, and I fully believe it just looking at the car. Um, and then we've had one in with something like twenty one thousand with a snap chain, um, where it had done a lot of start stop journeys and things like that, and the turbo went on it, and the DPF cracked, and all the rest of it. So I think, basically, we get a lot of cars in from London. Obviously, we're not too far away from London. Um, and these just aren't what I'd call a London car. I don't know why anyone would own a diesel engine ingenium Land Rover in London. However, I would own the petrols. Now, you'll see some of that clip. We They do have timing chain issues, but nowhere near as common as the diesel ones, and it's quite rare. They mainly suffer, which I know I didn't... 
I, some of the footage has disappeared, but they've got variators on the camshaft, they've got pulleys, and normally one of them fails. That's the biggest issue with them. Um, and you don't have to do the whole timing chain um, to change them, you can do it without, but if the timing chain is stretched, um, it's not really worth not doing. Um, I'm not sure, because I'm recording this before putting it together, you may see actually a clip that we sent to a customer, because that explained a little bit better um, or showed a little bit better because I did film more on that Jaguar that you saw the chain on um, But it's gone. I don't know where the footage is gone. I Would own an Evoke if I lived in London I would get a petrol one if I lived doing journeys to school and back and very short journeys I would own a petrol one if I did own a diesel one I would do a oil change every five to eight thousand miles now, especially if you're doing low mileage on the motor, if you're doing motorway mileage, maybe stretch it to 10 or 12, but I just think five to 8,000 miles, if you, especially if you're doing low mileage, just do an oil and filter change. If you're handy yourself, ask your local garage or garage that you're friendly with, maybe they'll give you a bit of advice. Maybe we'll do a video on doing an oil changing one. Do it yourself. Pop into Land Rover or Ford, maybe, because Ford use the same oil, same spec, and they're cheap, it's cheaper to buy. Buy the oil and filter, do it yourself. Still get it serviced at the regular intervals. If you know if you're not if you don't feel that you're fully competent enough, get it checked by an expert. But just do an oil and filter change. It does definitely help. Um, but yeah, so potentially we might have one as a family car, an engineering engine thing. Um, I suppose it's a little bit different for me because I'm not scared of it. Um, but we will still do regular oil changes. The sort of journeys we do. We're between two motorways, so generally it's on the motorway most days, but to be fair, only doing short journeys, but I do do a fairly long journey at least once a week, so I just take it with me and I don't think we'll have a problem. Um, like I say, I, it's a difficult one because I don't think customers and consumers are driving these cars in a wrong way, but these diesel engines just aren't suited to a, a lot of what the journeys are doing, that they're for. I mean, an Evoque or Discovery Sport isn't really a what you'd call a rep car at the motorway. The Jaguar XTs and stuff seem to be, you know, a lot of them do a lot of motorway journeys. But the Evoke and Discovery normally says to me, school run car. Um, and I completely get why people want to own one. They buy them because they want a Land Rover, a fancy, fancy-ish Range Rover, a nice car to drive, and they are lovely. I had a red one. I don't think we did anywhere near enough filming on it, one we bought to sell. It was a lovely car. Um, but you, you also don't go into a car sales you know, place to buy a car and go, well, we're doing this sort of short journey and no one's ever said to you, well, don't buy that. You know, uh, it's, hard, it's hard for me to explain or say how I'm trying to explain it, if, if that makes sense. But they're, they're, they don't suit the school run lifestyle. The petrol one's fine, just grab a petrol one. I know you might think, well, we won't get as much miles, because it doesn't matter. Just get the petrol one, they're nice enough cars. I mean, that being said, an Audi Q3 or a BMW X3, something like that, doesn't seem to suffer, even doing local journeys, nowhere near as much as these ones do. Um, I've got, got to be straight up, I don't think the reliability is, matches them, or a Mercedes GLE or something, GLC, whatever they call them, um, or to be honest, a, anything with a Hyundai or a Kia 1.7, but people don't want to buy a Hyundai or a Kia, they want a nice luxury Range Rover, but just get the petrol, the petrol ones are good. They do suffer with a few things, but nowhere, like I say, no, nothing like the diesels. They suffer mainly that cam pulley. There's a valve, there's a variable valve block on top of the engine, um, which adjusts the timing or the valve timing and the cam timing. They do play up occasionally, and they are quite expensive, but not very often. Um, so yeah, that is my sort of take on it. I would, yeah, I don't think they're as bad as this video is made out. There are plenty of there on the road, and we've got lots of customers with them, you know, to be honest with you, most of them have had timing chains, admittedly. Um, but other than that, they, they haven't been too bad. Um, but I don't, yeah, like I say, I, I know I keep probably repeating myself, but this town driving, I think, does start a cycle of issues with the car, DPF problems, oil dilution. So the DPF is trying to regenerate. We're doing short journeys. It's not regenerating properly. It's dumping diesel in the oil. The oil's filling out. Then you're getting problems with turbos and, and, and all the rest of it. Um, so yeah, that is that is my take on it. Buy one, just buy a petrol. If you don't think you do the mileage, just buy a petrol one. Um, and there was a comment actually in the last video. He said he owned about six of them or something, and yet he's, and they had no problems. But his wife's one, 
where she poodles around town and that, has had endless problems, and I think that sums it up. I do think there was an issue where the dealership should have sold the petrol ones more, um, but maybe they didn't know about the problems. I suppose it was early days. So that's my take on it. I hope I haven't scared anyone too much. Um, I would own one. I would own one. Um, but with it bearing in, bear in mind that the, the sort of journeys you need to be doing in them, um, whether I buy a petrol one, probably, or I probably would buy an X3, to be honest with you, um, or Mercedes. The Mercedes don't tend to have loads of problems. All cars have issues, then there's going to be comments or you know people thinking, well, I've got an X3 and I've had no, problem, no end of problems with it. You always get that. But the sort of, um, yeah, the, the cars I sort of see, uh, the, the X3 and the Mercs, they tend to be a lot more reliable, or the Hyundai's and stuff, but people want a Range Rover for the sake that it. it's a Range Rover, and I get that, just buy the right engine. Sorry again for the long video, um, we just wanted to get it all in there, um, just to get it done so we can move on to other things. Um, at the end of the last video, I did ask, would I buy one, and I said yes. So the only way to fully put my money where the mouth is, put my money where my mouth is, is do exactly that, just to say, look, they're not all that bad. Um, I purchased this one. Um, I thought I'd do it properly. Uh, this has actually already had the timing chain done, so I thought that would save me a job. And it's got 52,000 miles on it, so I thought we'd get a nice low mileage one. Um, and yeah, so we'll see how we get on with it. Oh no. The engine's knocking. Oh, well on that disappointment, uh, we'll see you on the next video, I guess.